I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson, and we are live at the Neptune Theater, Seattle! <laughs> this is Star Talk Live. Eugene Merman, tell us who you brought with you. I have brought the wonderful Paul F. Tompkins. Yes. Hello. Comedian extraordinaire. Thank you, Thank you the universe. <laughs> and the lovely and equally wonderful Kristen Schaal. Really excited. And we, we, and we had an extra seat. We, we caught him just walking around outside. The one and the only Will Wheaton. We all know and love. Thank you. Of all the timelines I currently exist in, this is my favorite. <laughs> Excellent. Now, now, how many remember this guy in when he was a little kid in that movie? Uh, you remember that movie? I wasn't in the Goonies. <laughs> and I'm not doing the truffle shuffle for you, okay. so if that's what you came for, leave. So we're less concerned about your childhood acting as we are Later, in your later years, you took some seriously geek roles in a lot of TV programs. And what's interesting to me is, you can have actors who just like are paid to do that, but you, you, that was you. I was an enormous Star Trek fan before I was cast in Next Generation. As Wellesley Crusher. Yeah, in, you know what, I'm actually, I'm so much of a Star that's Trek That's where fan. I know you from! <laughs> oh! This now, was killing me. <laughs> now, aren't you glad that I didn't just tell you? Because I, I would have robbed you no, from I'm the glad. joy of that discovery. I appreciate that. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. I remembered uh, toy soldiers, and then it's sort of blank after. Yeah. <laughs> you in the entertainment industry until about 2006. Um, so, so Wellesley Crusher I, in, in I, Star Trek: The Next Generation TNG. If you're in the circle, right. Yeah. If you don't have, if, if you're very busy, you don't have time to say things like yeah. the Next Generation. <laughs> Um, I'm such a big Star Trek fan that I noticed that your sideburns are actually pointing at right Star Trek. He noticed! <laughs> I, used to, I used to have like uh, 1970s mutton chop sideburns. They, they were in style at the time, okay? And then I, I transitioned and I said my homage to Star Trek was to do the, do the pointy. So he so when I was first person to ever notice that is right here to my right. Achievement unlocked. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, thank you for that. So, when I was a kid and I was working on Star Trek, uh, LeVar Burton and I were the only two original Next Gen cast members who were sort of like, uh, like very proud out of the closet Star Trek fans. Um, nobody else really knew the show like we did. And I would go there So you and, were like legitimate characters on the show in that sense. Yeah, there were like, I did things like uh, when I was flying the spaceship, you know, like you do. Um, uh, it was, these, the buttons that we had didn't, didn't really do anything. It's, it's what? kind of, yeah, I know. Well, it's, really? It's, this is what I, I want you to imagine that you're at like an important conference and you're trying to use your iPhone. It's very much like that. It happens a lot. Yeah. Um, but I like, I invented a series of, of buttons and the, this particular series made the ship go to warp speed. This particular series of, of buttons uh, put us into standard orbit. Nobody knew it, nobody cared about it, but it was very important to me. Well, it probably showed in your face. Maybe. Like you're acting. You're like, yeah, oh. the Robert De Niro yeah. space shuttle button yeah. pushing. Yeah. 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 So I, I wrote a book about it uh, that nobody wanted to buy. <laughs> what kind of conversation is that? Sorry. So. Let's get hey, back. you asked. Let's get back to the deck of the Enterprise. Okay. Okay, so there's all this technology there. I know yeah. it's fake technology, but right. it's still technology we can think about. Yeah. And if I may share this brief story, I... I, I wish you would. Though. Okay, I, in the original, <laughs> I, I'm old enough, so I remember, like, the original, thinking, would, could that happen or could it not happen? And I'm thinking, all right, they got this thing that makes food hot real quick, okay? Maybe that'll happen <laughs> one day, all right? And they had this little card they stuck in a machine. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't remember any scenes of the original Star Trek where they just heated up food. No, there is! What? There's a, there's a... But they would, like, it would food make would food. Mat it would materialize yes. hot. <laughs> that is different from just like, being... Uh, computer, uh, set pot pie to warmer than now. <laughs> exactly. 
So here's the thing. Of they clearly the never watched the third season of the original <laughs> Star Trek. Of all the technologies with the, tr the, the tricorder right. and the, the communicator, the one that I, I said this will never happen in 500 years was where the doors opened up just by walking <laughs> in front of it. It's like, no, that'll never happen. I, that's how old I am. I there was a day when doors did not open for you when you approached them. I think less realistic is a world that only has jazz and, co and classical music that isn't copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Patrick Stewart and I did did a scene once in Next Generation where we were. Isn't that a uh, great sentence? Patrick Stewart and I did a scene. <laughs> that, so, that's 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 Will Wheaton here. Okay, go. So uh, Picard and Wesley are going. Wait, wait, I gotta into, ask. Why did he have a French name and he spoke with a British accent? Jean-Luc well, Picard and he speaks Brit. Right. Well, probably because sometime between now and then, uh, Britain probably just storms across the channel and oh. and and occupies <laughs> occupies France. But you think yeah. they built the channel for convenience? <laughs> I mean, listen, there are plenty of websites on GeoCities devoted to exposing this conspiracy. <laughs> you can reach them all in the same web ring. It's not hard. So Patrick and I did this did this scene once where we were we're walking into uh, like we're on a star base and I think Wesley's going to do a you know one of those academy tests and I think he's going to have his artificial heart replaced and they had speaking built... of your character in the third person yeah that is so classy okay. so they had they had built this set that had this this glass door just a, a regular door with a handle on it and we walked up to it and I said to Patrick Wesley has never experienced a door that doesn't just open for him so. <laughs> Let's do this thing when, the, when, the, when they're rolling where I, I will walk up and I'll just stop there and look at it. Like, what the hell is going on? What do you on? do with this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then he was like, oh, and then I'll look at you. Like, oh, kids. And then I'll push the door open and go through. <laughs> and we did it and it made it into the episode. <laughs> So we're doing like this kind of schlocky, sort of like physical comedy bit on Star Trek, and I guess we just snuck it through. Uh, no, I, it's it. Every now and then, I think it, it maybe needed it. We needed that. Well, because our science was airtight. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got my list here. So, so some Star Trek. We had the warp drive. You need that, of course. Right. Yeah. Because here's here's the galaxy, and you're on one side of the galaxy. You want to get to the other. In case you didn't know, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years. So traveling at the speed of light, if you watched a ship do that, it would take 100,000 years. So they invoke the warp and drive. And 100,000 years is equal to one light year? Or no, 100,000 light, light year? years is 100,000 light years. Well, how long is a light year? Uh, oh, so, so a light year is, a, is distance. And how far is that? It is uh, 5.8 trillion miles. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so, 5.8 trillion times 100,000, that's how many miles that is. Okay. Okay, so now, so, so they put that in the That would take years. <laughs> it's right. It's okay. We can give it more power. <laughs> that's exactly right. So, so you warp space, so where you are gets closer to where you're trying to go, and then you, t you go through a little wormhole, you unwarp space, and there you are. And you got there during the TV commercial. That's how that works, right? So, so warp drives, I'm cool with that. Um, duh. Yeah, I'm down with that. Uh, tell me about uh, Captain Kirk. Yeah. He had a way with the alien ladies. He most certainly did. And why would first the aliens be female, right? I mean, right. There's there's life on Earth that is non-gender, and he's yes. going to another planet, and there's gender. Right. And so. And then he, yeah, why doesn't he have sex with gender neutral like piles of alien goo? <laughs> it's a very yeah. intriguing exploration. <laughs> well, actually, in the uh, classic Star Trek episode, Devil in the Dark, no one ever really explains how that Horda became pregnant. Oh, the Horda, that was very good. Horda was that life form based Silicon -based on- Silicon-based life Silicon-based life. Right. Silicon, directly below carbon on the periodic table. So they were boning. Right? Uh, Ooh la la. No, no, no. No, they don't bone with each other. Oh. They each bone with the same other elements. Oh, so they have an understanding. They, they have a total it's understanding. It's an open I element see. bone. So, so carbon... Mormon silicon creatures, I understand. <laughs> so right, so it was a pregnant uh, silicon-based right. life. Yeah, yeah so, so and you'll it, notice that it's, that it's its little babies didn't have any hair, just like William Shatner. Ooh. 
Have you said this to his face? No. Okay, I didn't think so. Yeah. We can try to get him to listen to this and then yes. <laughs> so, so, in, so the point is we are carbon-based chemistry and in principle you can create life such as we on any, based on any element in that column on the periodic table. Even adamantium? <laughs> You know, one of my favorite sci-fi novels ever is uh, Larry Niven's Ring World. And it is, it is one of the books that really helped me understand that I, was, uh, that I was really was totally different from everybody else that I knew, that I was really nerdy, that I really loved science, that, that this, this imagined world was more interesting than my own. And what really blew me away about that was just the scope of the ring world itself and how it stays in place and all of those things. And, and, and I know it's unstable, I'm getting there. And, 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 and Someone so, in the audience said, it's unstable. Wow. Yeah, so that so well, you guys you? have a science fact, please don't keep it down. <laughs> so, 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 no. so there's nothing more entertaining to the non-geek than watching geeks argue over <laughs> non-existent future worlds. I right. liked how so, this guy was trying to head it off because as if Will was gonna say, so we should do that. Right. <laughs> we should make it a reality. I'm just so, stuck on the fact that we glossed over, so you'll take a space and you'll flip it over like a tortilla and you'll get there. <laughs> I'm cool with that. What kind of energy are they using to take all of space and put it into a bowl and just flip over? So Can you explain it with a different ethnic food? <laughs> she doesn't like Mexican. Bending a, a grain of rice that is... Yeah, it's, tortilla. It's what, it's what happens when you mix matter and antimatter through a dilithium matrix to control well, the reaction. Well, then it would just explode. God. So well, anyway, it, wait, wait, listen, it takes an enormous amount of energy to do that. Okay. Maybe the energy of all of the stars in the known universe? Approximately that, actually. Lucky so, guess. Good guess, yeah. <laughs> so anyway... So you got a different, so, so, a different so, world. So, right, so Niven's going to conventions, and he's speaking about Ring World, and people in the audience are shouting out, the Ring World is unstable. So he writes a second book called Ring World Engineers, where he goes to repair the Ring World, because that's a good way to spend your time. And in, <laughs> and in that book... Um, there's all this interspecial sex. Um, and, it's, and it's sort of this, like, uh, it's, it's the way that they sort of, like, they consummate a deal by, by engaging in this interspecial sex. And, but, but does that lead to offspring? Uh, I don't think Donkeys. it does. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think it does. Well, that would be mules. Mules, yeah, What think. about STDs? Well, <laughs> some, Space TDs. Some, some people think, some people think that that's actually how Rick Santorum was formed. <laughs> Un unfortunately, due to his antipathy to science, we haven't been able to actually test. Right. So now you have interspecies sex. Do we answer? Did they have STDs? I, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't Maybe covered that, in the but book. No, well, but, but actually, but too, in, the, in, the, in, in Ring World, they, in Ring World, they don't. But, but I mean, that's sort of, I mean, Ring that World just... sounds like an STD right there. Well, it is. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it is unstable, as we heard. <laughs> I guess. But, but you know what's weird is, like, I think, like, you raise an interesting point. Like, how did Captain Kirk's dick not f just f fall off? <laughs> I guess that conversation took place between the scenes. Like, that was... It's one like, of the, oh, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. Before we do this. Yeah. I do have to know. <laughs> will you disintegrate my dick? <laughs> <laughs> and Will, that some acting work he was doing in his face. Right, Boy, right. Yeah. Yeah. I lose my dick, yes. but it's worth it. Yeah, you know? uh, yeah. Those hot blue babes. You yeah, know, you can't. So, t tell me about the holodeck. That was your. That was your. your the holodeck reign. was us. And yes. Did, did, uh, I, I didn't see every episode. Did you ever get to go in the holodeck? I did. I spent a great deal of time. I was actually in the holodeck on the pilot. And what were you? What were you imagining for your own world? Uh, well, um, in the pilot. Well, of well, the holodeck is. A room you go into and live out all of your fantasies, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, it's sort of like the internet, um, and uh, but real. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, 
Interestingly, so they, the, the small the, detail there. The idea was that the, the Galaxy-class starships in Next Generation would go farther and they would be out in space longer than the Constitution-class ships in the original Star Trek series. So to, in order to sort of like keep people uh, from like, uh, you know, uh, going... Killing uh, everyone. Yeah, that. I was re- searching for a reference and I was like, what are those Argentinian soccer players called? And then I lost it. Um, so uh, they, they were... Um, they, they did a couple of things. They put families on the ship so that people could be with their families, which is a super great idea when you're sending a thing out into unknown space where you're definitely going to be involved in, in wars and things. And then they built these holodecks that would let people go and sort of escape the drudgery of being on a, on a starship. The problem with that is that the holodecks constantly malfunctioned. Like every time you would, I don't know. This imaginary would, thing called the holodeck. Yeah. Malfunction. Was, yeah, it turned into but, a plot But since device. it's imaginary, they could have just not made it malfunction. It, it would be funny yeah, if right. in the first episode of Star Trek, they all went into space with their families and all the families died right away. I mean, I guess it's good that that didn't happen. Right. I, I would think that the holodeck would be really addictive, too. Like, how do you keep people there was out actually, of the holodeck? There was, I'd be in there the whole time. Yeah, and like, the worst job on the spaceship is the guy that has to go in and mop up the holodeck. That's the worst. So they, they, got, um, they, they got you the, the, the UV light, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah boy. Okay. Yeah. You do not want to go in there with that. But it's a great idea, and it's actually, right now, I'm, 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 I'm voicing an audiobook called Masters of Doom, and it's about John Romero and John Carmack, the guys that, that invented uh, Wolfenstein 3D, and then Doom, and then Quake. And, and it was the holodeck on Next Generation that was really driving Carmack to program 386 computers to do really incredible, technologically so astounding Star things. Star Trek is influencing the creativity of video engineers. Yes, and uh, if you assume that that next generation exists at you know at a point in the future of our timeline, it creates this interesting paradox that people are watching Star Trek and then developing technology that they that that was inspired by Star Trek that then Star Trek uses. Yeah, it's like Battlestar Galactica. I get it. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so one of my favorite devices on the deck was the the visor that that Jordy wore. Yeah, sure. That is the did that have an official name? It was just the visor. And visor's an acronym, but I don't remember what it stands for. Does anybody in the audience know what it stands for? No, nah, I didn't think so. Okay. V's got to be for V's got to be vision. Visual, independent, surreal, or, <laughs> re- re- or reality. Like, yeah. I love oh, that's that. actually, that's right. I yeah. love any acronym Excellent. that includes or. Yeah. The or. <laughs> we haven't nailed this down, but we need to call it something. Yeah. So, so here's the oh, thing. Wait. If in astrophysics... We basically have that, but you don't wear it, right? So, so there's visible light, and we used to only build telescopes that viewed visible light in the universe. Fools. And then we said, and we said, yeah, we're, we're like, we're empowered by these telescopes. And then we discovered, wait a minute, there's this thing called infrared, which sits right on the other side of red, and something called ultraviolet, which sits beyond violet. And so then we built telescopes sensitive in those reach, and the universe is doing something else. We look in the same spot, and it's something else happening there. In fact, with ultraviolet telescopes, we discovered black holes. And so then, then we said, what's beyond ultraviolet? Then you find x-rays. We build a telescope out of those. There's x-ray things going on in the universe. And then on the other side of the, 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 the infrared, there's microwaves, and then radio waves, and then the gamma rays. And the whole electromagnetic spectrum is talking to us from the universe, and we've got a telescope lined up in every band. You're walking a fine line towards conspiracy theory, but I believe you. <laughs> One of the things that I loved about Gene Roddenberry, um, the when, creator, uh, of, the Star creator of Star Trek, um, uh, he, was, he was a good friend of mine when we were working on the show, and was sort of a mentor to me. And Star Trek, the original series, the secular humanism of Star Trek, informed 100% of my morality and my worldview. And uh, One of the great <laughs> features of the Thank show you. was its the storytelling captured social cultural issues yeah. well, in a way where, oh, it's just science fiction, but in fact, it was pointing directly back to us. And what you were saying about like all those telescopes that we've, that we've made and the things that we can observe in the universe, I've done a, a number of educational short videos for the Spitzer Space Telescope program at Caltech, and it's awesome. The, 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 the things that that telescope can see are mind-blowing. And when Spitzer you're talking about that... Spitzer Telescope is tuned for the infrared, so a whole telescope 
orbiting like Hubble is orbiting, except it's checking the universe out in infrared, which enables you to see deep into otherwise opaque gas clouds, revealing the birth of stars and planets within. So yeah, wear a robe cool. around the house. <laughs> <laughs> so you're talking about all of those things, and, I, and, and the thing when- A when, lead when, robe. When, <laughs> <laughs> When we, when we talk about those things that, that we have done, the things that science has done, those things that human beings have done just by, through the application of knowledge, um, I think, fuck yeah, we did that. Like, we did that. We, we, we sat down as a, as a species and we decided we want to know these things. We want to understand these things. And we will develop and build instruments that let us do that. And one of the things Gene Roddenberry used to say was, um, there's, there is no limit to what mankind can do when we just sort of work together. And the only time I ever saw Gene get angry, we were at a convention and someone was going on and on about the face on Mars and pyramids on Mars and, and just a bunch of stuff that was like pseudoscience. And aliens came to Earth and aliens built the pyramids. And Gene was like, no, they didn't. Human beings built the pyramids. We did that. He was, he was incensed. Well, so he missed an opportunity. What he should have said was, the fact that some members of the human species look upon the pyramids and are so awestruck by them that they cannot even believe that it is a product of our own species is that much more of a testament to how brilliant the human mind can be. I, I still find it difficult to believe that that pot that you can drain pasta through, that that was a human being. <laughs> <laughs> that came up with that. <laughs> it wasn't even on Star Trek. They just out of nowhere. <laughs> so, the, so the cloaking device. So a, a, a couple of comments about that, if I may. Um, no, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. I take it back. Um, I'll allow it. You are invisible if the band of light you use to observe it passes through it. So windows are cloaking devices for visible light. If you shine visible light in a window, it goes through. So you, you don't see the window. You see what's on the other side of the window. So if you but use- But also you can see windows. <laughs> <laughs> I know that no one ever contests you, but I can totally see windows. I saw one today. Yeah. <laughs> My hotel room. Window City. I was on a plane. It was full of windows. <laughs> I kept going. G Gene? Yes. Oh, Eugene, clean your windows, and then maybe what I said will apply. Oh! <laughs> Snap. Snap. You got I will clean my hotel windows, <laughs> and then go downstairs to the front desk and be like, I can't see my windows! Because <laughs> I cleaned them too much. Someone stolen my windows. <laughs> So now, how do you propose we settle this? I want a new room with windows. <laughs> no, cross-country car race. That's the only way to, st to settle the, the issue of stolen windows. Here's the thing. So this space is, the, the walls are transparent to radio waves. And that's why you can like, have radio reception, even microwave reception. And so, so one way to, be, to cloak is to use a beam that goes right through you. Okay, So that's one way. Another way to cloak is they found a way to have the light transmit a path around the object and then continue out the other side. And so that way, if you can do that for all beams of light, then you could be invisible to any way they try to detect you. Sounds like it could get kind of hot. <laughs> uh, no, be, actually, it would be, actually, it'd be kind of cool because you feel warm by absorbing energy from light that hits your body. That's why it always feels warmer in the sunlight, even though the air temperature is the same as it was in the shade. The shade is not cooler in air temperature than standing in sunlight. So stop saying that. <laughs> it has been settled. <laughs> it's the same air. You so shade mongers make me sick. Oh. <laughs> so what happens is you step out of the shade into sunlight and your skin absorbs radiant energy from that source of light we call the sun. And that way, you have two sources of energy into you, the vibration of the molecules of the air, as well as the sunlight. And air is transparent to sunlight. That's why you can see the sun in the daytime. 
<laughs> so, so the sun is cloaking the air? Yes, very good. Air has sun cloaking device. That, in fact, Kristen, for, if no one told you, why would you even, and this Eugene might have to pipe into this, if no one told you, why would you even think there was anything between you and the audience right now? They're right there. I can what are you talking? Are you high? No. <laughs> you went from so much science to like, who knows where we all are now? What I'm, if I'm, I'm you saying. and red is green? Air is transparent to visible light. It is not transparent to ultraviolet light, which is why when we first detected ultraviolet light, we needed to put a telescope above Earth's atmosphere, and we would not have known about black holes until we put the ultraviolet and X-ray telescopes above the atmosphere. That's all I'm saying. Is black holes the best name they could have come up with? <laughs> I, I, I made a, a, it's a really awesome name, first of all, for, because, because for, you know, a hole, if, if it's a hole in the ground and you fall in? Yeah, sure. A, a black hole, it's a three-dimensional hole. Mm -hmm. You fall in from any direction you approach it. Fact one, so that's an awesome hole. Fact Look, two. I, I, am not, I am not trying to denigrate the holes themselves. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. I, I mean, I, I, I let ultraviolet slide. That was definitely a lazy, like infrared sounds really cool. And then it's like, it's so violet, it's like ultraviolet. <laughs> Let's watch The Big Lebowski again. <laughs> the term was, in its defense, coined at the Spicoli Institute. <laughs> Well, just so you know, so you know, we had, we had, the way we looked at the visible spectrum, we ordered the light, Isaac Newton, my man, first did this, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, okay? What are you, mad that indigo's left out all the time? Yeah, no, no, because no, indigo doesn't belong there, all right? Isaac Newton had a mystical <laughs> fascination with the numeral seven, and he counted six colors. He said, I need a seventh one somewhere. Let's put in indigo. It's, it's, if you're going to put an indigo, there are 12 other colors you can put in there because the colors change continuously. Well, if he's your man, let indigo be his muse. Oh, I like that. Okay. He's my man. I let the, so he's got the seven colors. So we order them like red at the bottom, violet at the top. It's quite an arbitrary notion to order them that way. It's an increasing energy it is. But so when you go beyond the violet, it's ultraviolet. When you go below the red, it's infrared. Mm. You guys feel so dumb right now. <laughs> I still don't like it. I still don't like it. <laughs> so so if you leave the edges of Seattle, you go to ultra Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> the, the closer to Pike Place Market is infra. <laughs> All right, one last thing here. We got to end this segment. Uh, you know what, I like that medical scanner. That was good. You just wave the wand oh, and man, you just I know, know right? everything Yeah. without cutting you open. Right. We need that. Yeah. Um, you know, the guy that invented the MRI invented the MRI because of the device that he watched the original Star Trek and he watched Dr. McCoy sort of scan around on a thing and he thought, we should do that. We should, we should, there should be a way that we can see inside people's bodies without having to cut them open. So, and then he sort of like set his life to doing that. And so, I'm going to do a set at Stand Up MRI next week. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Stand Up MRI. <laughs> Some people are afraid to be rolled in on their back. It's the Stand Up MRI. Uh, magnetic the, um, resonance imaging. Discover it. That's, that's actually nuclear magnetic resonance. That's the physical principle. But, but that had... One it's of unstable. The <laughs> so, so. I have some very good news for you, Neil. A man in the audience says you're correct. <laughs> Achievement unlocked, Dr. Tyson. So here's the thing. The physical principle is nuclear magnetic resonance, but that term has one of the two famous N-words in it. And so you... To bring that technology into the hospital, people fear that N-word. And so they excised it from the name, came up with a new one. So it's magnetic resonance imaging, but it is so nuclear magnetic resonance. I'm just letting you know that. Right. And so you, you send a, mag a strong magnetic field across the nucleus 
of an atom and the nucleus aligns, then you can image what the different alignments are depending on the mass of the nucleus. And so you can see where different elements are inside your body without cutting you open. It's a brilliant device invented by a physicist who, by the way, had no specific interest in medicine. Happened to have been a, a physics professor of mine in college, just by coincidence. My point is, there are people who say, so that I want- that was your science class. That was my science <laughs> class, right. So he won the Nobel Prize for that. My point there is that people say, I want to live healthy, let's fund medical research. Wait a minute, every device in a hospital with an on-off switch that diagnoses the condition of your body without cutting you open. You're making me nervous about my health oh, right sorry, now. Oh, sorry, sorry. Like, is there something that I should know about? Do I have, stop, what's wrong? Is there like, what? Do I have like, what's wrong, what? No, wait, wait, yeah. Every one of those machines is based on a principle of physics discovered by a physicist who had no interest in medicine. And it took the medical technologist ah. to, say, to say, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, now you're and all sick. They're like, people should give me the money and I promise <laughs> to invent a thing for them of no specific description yet. You know, one of the really cool things about the... One of the really great things about the, um, the design of the computers on Next Generation, and specifically the tricorders, uh, Michael Kuder and Rick Sternbach are, were the guys that designed all of these things. And Mike had this idea in 1987 that eventually computers were going to be sort of operating system independent. And, and that you, uh, you would come up to a computer and the computer would, would one way or another know what you wanted it to do. And the computer would reconfigure itself uh, to, to serve that particular purpose. And that's kind of the, the under... That's to the core, serve man. <laughs> that's, yes. that's sort of the core philosophy of the LCARS system. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's why every computer in the enterprise uh, goes to red tube when Wesley walks by. But um, <laughs> they, uh, the medical tricorders on, on Next Generation were, uh, they were specifically designed so that the doctor could just sort of like, it's the coolest thing in the world, that the doctor just goes, what's wrong with this guy? Point, 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 and the thing set says everything. But you got to take that information to the ship's computer, and then use the ship's computer to sort of interpret all of that, all of that information. And some of my favorite, uh, some of my favorite, like fake computers on the Enterprise, were those things in in sick bay because of all the computers that we had. They were the ones that looked the most like real to me. And what is clear is that the most primitive thing today that the future will assess to be primitive is our hospitals. And right. evidence of that is you wouldn't be caught in 20-year-old hospital technology. You, the, the fact that the medical community, community says medical advances is so high and so great and we have come so far, the fact that they say that means they were not far yesterday. If you keep saying how far you've just come, it meant you're still improving, right? You're still not really there that's, yet. That's why I don't go to a doctor, I go to a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta bring this segment to a close. You're listening and observing and watching Star Talk, live in the Neptune Theater from Seattle.